Hi everybody, this is Dr. Michael Kentris with the Neurotransmitters, and today I'm fortunate to be joined by Dr. Rohit Marawar. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, selection of anti-seizure medications. So Dr. Marawar from Wayne State, uh, where you work in the epilepsy division. So just give us a little bit uh, about your background there and uh, any special projects you're working on and so forth. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, fantastic to be here and excited to talk about approach to anti-seizure medications. Uh, so as you mentioned, I work at Wayne State University, Detroit Medical Center in Detroit, Michigan for the past six years, uh, mostly in the epilepsy division, but it's a typical academic position with uh, teaching, research, admin, as you might imagine, in, mm-hmm. in addition to the clinical work. And uh, My specific interest is in epilepsy in the elderly and at the intersection of epilepsy and dementia. So some of the things that I do are uh, a um, multi-specialty epilepsy in older adult clinic for the past three years with the services of a a pharmacist or a pharmacy resident, I should say. Uh, And that's been going well. And uh, uh, I'm doing a few clinical trials in elderly and also some prospective observational studies, um, obviously cool. all elderly with epilepsy. No, well, yeah, that's always uh, something that I think, at least from the patient side, a lot of questions we get, at least from my own perspective, is that, you know, I'm I'm an older adult. Why am I developing a seizure at this stage in life? And that's that's I, we can kind of come around back to that at the end. But I yeah, think that's uh, a very probably a very common question in your clinic in particular. Yes. But every epileptologist, uh, at least in my experience, kind of has their own, uh, let's say, pet medications, uh, their own kind of process that they tend to approach. And there's some similarities, but uh, why don't you just walk us through kind of like how how your approach is to selecting someone with maybe a new diagnosis of epilepsy uh, and what medications you would normally kind of lean towards and how you would counsel these patients? Sure. So I think uh, maybe let's talk about from the perspective of uh, you know someone who is new to epilepsy, like someone yeah. as a like a resident who is still getting used to figuring out which anti-seizure medications to start. Mm-hmm. Um, so as you said, I think first we need to figure out if someone has a diagnosis of epilepsy, and as we know that re- that has specific requirements. So two unprovoked seizures in the last twenty-four hours, not last, sorry. Let me cancel that. <laughs> two, unpro- two unprovoked seizures, uh, uh, 24 hours apart, at least. Right. And then, or one unprovoked seizure and the risk of a second unprovoked seizure being greater than 60% based on history mm-hmm. and testing or a typical electroclinical epilepsy syndrome. So I think once mm-hmm. you have established that this is epilepsy and we want to start them on an anti-seizure medication, and we're talking about adults here, not pediatric, because pediatric will have a different thought process and different approach. Uh, So in adult patients, so first I think we need to figure out what kind of epilepsy is it. And, uh, and, uh, you know, based on the uh, most recent nomenclature, there are only four types of epilepsy, which I love because it's simple. (laughs) (laughs) You know, either it's focal, uh, generalized, or focal plus generalized or unknown, which is my favorite category because it's oh, right. <laughs> it's the most common it's one e- usually. It's easy to uh, put a, put put patient into unknown uh, sometimes because <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what's going on. Uh, but uh, I think if it's a focal epilepsy, uh, anything except ethosuximide goes right. Ethosuximide is one of that uh, one of those mm-hmm. medications which is narrow spectrum but only used in generalized epilepsy. So mm-hmm. if it's a focal anti medication, anything except ethosuximide goes. Then out of the three other categories, is it generalized, focal plus generalized or unknown, then you want to use a broad spectrum medication. So mm-hmm. In, in the broad spectrum medication means no narrow spectrum medication. So you right. throw out everything. You throw out your dilantin, you throw out your carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, and uh, its derivatives like uh, aptium. So no none of those, mm-hmm. and we just then have broad spectrum medications. So that's kind of one way of thinking about it. Kind of you can go about this as a 
ruling in or ruling out. So you are, this is kind of a way of ruling out. Okay, I don't want to use those medications. Right. The next thing is then uh, I personally tend to throw away all the old medications. I'm not going to use them. So uh, right. Talantin, Phenobarbital, Carbamazepine, Valproid. I don't want to use them going forward because of their long-term side effects, uh, interaction with other medications. Uh, so I never start them um, or start the patients on any of these older medications. If they are obviously coming to me with uh, these medications on board and doing well, then uh, you know I tend to continue them, but mm-hmm. don't start them. And that would be my request and suggestion to everyone who's listening to this. Uh, Although it's always interesting to me when you get a, a patient, you know, referred in from the maybe, a, you know, primary care doc, kind of maybe a little more in the rural because both of us work in the Midwest. So mm-hmm. there's, you know, certain areas of the country where there's a very much a, you know, a lack of neurologists and you'll get a family doctor who might be maybe a little you know long in the tooth. And uh, they start someone on on Phenytoin, Dilantin, uh and so whenever I see someone under the age of like 60 years old who's mm-hmm. on Dilantin, I'm like, how the heck did that happen? Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, there, there definitely is some, some questionable choice out there uh, in the wild, if you will. Yeah. Well, I think the worst combination is phenytoin plus fun, phenobarbital. And I've seen <laughs> young, young, you know, people in their 20s on that. Yeah. Uh, and that's uh, and that's never good long term. I mean, these are great no. seizure controlling medication, good efficacy, right. but uh, not good from a, a, a safety or a tolerability right. standpoint. And we are kind of blessed. I do. I know I'm veering off topic, but that's kind of <laughs> unfortunately how I go yeah. sometimes. But I, I had, we had an emergency medicine resident who was on rotation in uh, Haiti not too long ago, just uh, this last year. And he had a young, a, like an eight, nine year old girl. And, you know, as, as you might, one of the first questions you ask in some of uh some foreign countries is what what anti seizure medications do you have available? And it was exactly those two. It was phenytoin yeah. and phenobarbital. Yeah. And he's like, even those have to be flown up from the capital. Oh wow. And I was just like, Oof, that's that's a rough situation. Yeah. But yeah, so, um but yeah. Fortunately yeah. we're a little more blessed in the yeah. most parts of the United States to have more options that yeah. hopefully won't have those long term uh, I think we are definitely potential blessed. side effects. Yeah. yeah. We're definitely blessed. I think we need to be better at using that blessing. So maybe that's a way to put it. <laughs> well said, well said. <laughs> so, okay. So I think we've talked about some of the uh, uh, some of the process here. So moving on, then I think you have to think of the comorbidities <clears throat> that the patient has. So I kind of think of it as a positive sum or a negative sum. So a positive uh-huh. sum means you are going to have some kind of benefit if you choose that particular anti medication. So, for example, mm-hmm. if you're aiming for weight loss in some patients or some patients might like to have weight loss, then topiramate and zonisamide are good options. If right, a right. patient has migraines or other chronic headaches, then uh, topiramate or gabapentin might be good options. Mm-hmm. Uh, if someone has neuropathy that you want to treat anyways, then gabapentin, pregabalin, even lamotrigine, oxcarbazepine, and Vimpat or lacosamide, those can be considered second choice um, medications for neuropathy. If you're looking for mood stabilization, lamotrigine is again a good option. Uh, for many of these, even Depakote is a good option, right? So for headache, mm-hmm. for mood stabilization, but again, as I said, if you can avoid Depakote, right, right. I think uh, that would be great, especially in young females. Uh, then you have to think about what potential side effects uh, this particular medication might have in this particular patient and then try to avoid that. So for example, if you want to avoid weight gain, then don't start them on gabapentin or pregabalin. If you want to avoid weight loss, which can happen, a lot of older patients that I see, they already have poor appetite, especially if they have dementia, right, right. You don't start them on topiramate or zonisamide. If you, if you are already... Um, worried about cognitive impairment, as in some of the patients that I see, I again avoid right. topiramate and zonisamide mm-hmm. because they can have cognitive, uh, negative cognitive uh, side effects, especially uh, word finding difficulties. If uh, 
if patient has established anxiety, depression, uh, has agitation, irritability, short temperedness, uh, then avoid uh, Keppra and avoid Parampanil slash Ficompa. Right. Uh, if uh, someone is a young female, by definitely please avoid Depakote or Valproic yes. Acid uh, because if they get pregnant, there are a lot of uh, pregnancy-related side <clears> effects <throat> um, uh, for the young ones on that. And if you can avoid Topomax, I think that would be great too because I think after, after uh, Depakote, Topomax is probably the... Um, medication that is most likely to have congenital uh, side effects yeah so that's another kind of level of thinking then i think this is coming to the next level which is i think kind of the practical practicality of uh, prescribing a medication so mm -hmm. i think you have to think about the ease of use for the patient Absolutely. Uh, use ease of acquiring the medication whether that's cost related or insurance related mm -hmm. and then you have to think about adherence so, so for example, brand name medications and the current brand name medications we have are Breviact, Ficompa, mm -hmm. Excopri, Aptium. Uh, so these are probably four commonly used brand name medications right now. And these are great medications. And uh, mm -hmm. But sometimes what happens is that they might not be covered by insurance or there might be oh, a high yeah. copay. So... Do you want to go through that process? And that's a question you have to ask yourself. And you also have to think about if the patient runs into a problem getting the medication, will they get back to you? Because a lot of the patients that I see, they might not tell me that they had problem getting these medications. And, you know, you find out three months later that they never started this medication. Right. As they continue having uncontrolled seizures the exactly. entire time. Exactly. Yeah. Not, not so, ideal. Yeah, not, not ideal. So uh, at least in my practice, I try to avoid brand name medications. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this brand name. But I think I've just mm -hmm. learned from my mistakes that, uh, that these scenarios happen. Um, oh, yeah. Then you have to think about uh, once daily medications, which might be better for adherence. Uh, especially mm -hmm. in people with cognitive impairment or people who are just busy and you know don't like medications twice a day. So then right. once daily medications would be Keppra extended release, Lamotrigin extended release, uh, Topomax extended release, which is Trocandy. Mm -hmm. um, you have Oxteller, which is Oxcravazvin extended release, mm -hmm. uh, Parampanel and Aptium. So these are mm -hmm. your kind of extended release once a day medication. Uh, you have to think about uh, medication interactions. If this is a patient who you want to, who is already on some medications and you're adding a second medication or a third medication, because we know mm -hmm. there is interaction between Lamictal and Depakote. So Depakote will increase Lamictal levels. Um, so you have to keep right. that in mind. Uh, you have to, um, Onfi and Excopri have a lot of um, side effects together. So, right. uh, especially uh, drowsiness and sedation. Uh, Breviact yeah. can interact with Fenitoin. The, yeah. yeah. The epidiolex as well. The if epidiolex as well, yeah. yeah. The, so, yeah. Exactly. With Onfi, yeah. So, these medication interactions uh, within the in, uh, anti-seizure medication world, you have to keep in mind. Plus, obviously, you have to keep in mind the other medications that the patient is taking. Right. Non-neurology, such as uh, warfarin. Uh, maybe some mm -hmm. chemotherapeutic agents. Um, so these, again, are ripe for uh, medication interaction. Even really common things like statins, you know, especially with those older, older. hepatically metabolized ones. You know, uh, I remember that's one of the classic uh, epilepsy board questions is yeah. uh, someone with refractory cholesterol, uh, what medication they are. I think it was carbamazepine. If, yes, carbamazepine. If I remember the question correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, I was going to bring it up in the uh, discussion of oh, the older, sorry, older patients. No, no, that's okay. <laughs> but that's a, that's a really good point because that has been shown now, like these older medications, which uh, which decrease the efficacy of statins by interacting against them, right. they increase the risk of stroke. Uh, so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, again, good to avoid these older medications. Yeah, yeah. So I think that was but, a yeah, maybe it, a... Uh, it, yeah, it's right. So it's like, what, what should, should we put everybody on low teracetam, right? There's no uh, no interactions with the, Kepra. The, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we, we can take a dig at our neurosurgeon colleagues and say that that is always the right answer. It's it's rarely <laughs> the wrong answer. I'll give them that. Uh, well, I think uh, uh, 
a scenario that I have seen not infrequently is patients with mm-hmm. TBI, especially frontal lobe TBI oh, that get started oh, on Kepra. That might and, be the wrong answer there. Yeah, <laughs> and then <laughs> they come in and they're all angry at you and you are like wondering right. why are they angry at me? I didn't do anything. This is my first time seeing you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, I always, um, I always, when I, cause I have a lot of, uh, we don't have neurology residents where I work. So I have internal medicine, emergency mm-hmm. medicine, uh, sometimes family. And, you know, I was to tell them like, you know, love that does have, you know, about like about a 10% incidence of neuropsychiatric side effects. Yeah. And those can be really bad sometimes all the way up to yes. like frank psychosis. So it yes. can be, it can be very debilitating. Yeah. Uh, and if there's a history of a preexisting mood disorder or maybe a TBI, a traumatic brain injury, uh, that could even be as high as 20% depending on what literature you look at. So yeah. it's it's not inconsequential, but it is yeah, frequently yeah. overlooked uh, most yeah, of the time. And, and I'm sure anyone who has been practicing epilepsy for a while, they would probably have you know, at least a few patients who... Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, whose personality completely changed or got better once they were yeah. taken off Capra. Uh, yes, yes, that that has happened a few times. I'm curious what your thought is. I've tried this a few times based off of some of the uh, pediatric literature where you do like a low dose of vitamin B6. I've never had it work successfully in an adult patient. I tried it yeah. numerous times when I'm trying to like cross, cross titrate. Maybe it'll help ameliorate some of the side effects in the interim. Yeah. Oftentimes to no avail, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I have tried that also. I tried it in adults. Um, the problem is we don't know what the dose should be in adults. Uh, um, so I tried fairly high doses, checked their B6 levels that were, you know, with above reference range. But my, as, uh, as with you, my uh, experience was not consistent. Hmm. And then I always worry, oh, my God, to give this person a B6 neuropathy. Uh, exactly. Trying to, yeah, it's like the best thing is just to get them off the medication to something else, hopefully. Right. But, um, but yeah. So so kind of let's, let's move a little bit like kind of, you know, we've got someone maybe in the more geriatric population. Since that's kind of your, your area of mm-hmm. particular expertise, how do you go about, I know obviously these same general principles are going to yes. apply, but... But how does your medication selection differ from someone who might be seeing just a more general adult population? I think uh, you have to keep in mind what is different um, in the older adults as compared to younger mm-hmm. adults. So, uh, so you know, there are a few things. So, first of all, their process of absorption and elimination is different. Mm. So, they have less right. gastric absorption. They have... Uh, uh, decrease in serum albumin, which leads to decreased distribution. Right, right. They have less uh, biotransformation in the liver, and they have mm-hmm. less renal elimination. So, uh, you know, the total combined effect of these changes, this physiologic age-related changes, right. is that they need lower levels of medications. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, you cannot just translate whatever you give in younger adults or whatever your first uh, um, uh, target dose is, and just translate mm-hmm. that directly to adults. So you have to be a little bit mindful that they might not need that high of a dose, and they're also more susceptible to side effects. That's um, a good point. So uh, the, the problem with, uh, or, or I shouldn't say problem, but I think the the, um, the difficulty in treating older adults is that you have, you are kind of stuck between the rock and the hard place with many of these patients because even if we don't treat them, obviously they'll have seizures, they'll have falls, and it's not Mm -hmm. safe. But even starting them on medications will lead to falls, (laughs) will lead to side effects. So you have to be really careful about uh, how you manage them. Uh, But having said that, uh, you know, regarding what uh, I should, I, I do or not do, Again, avoid older medications. You know, like mm-hmm. if, you know, if it's if it's uh, dangerous in younger adults, it's even more so in older adults, especially mm-hmm. with their polypharmacy, uh, with inter- medication interactions, uh, and the burden of side effects they're going to have by being on so many medications. There are some specific examples that I would like to give for older adults. Yeah. One is uh, hyponatremia with carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine. It's more mm-hmm. common in older yeah. adults. Uh, 
especially if they are on diuretics, which many of our older adults are for hypertension. Um, so the uh, rate of hyponatremia is very high, with ox- specifically with uh, oxcarbazepine. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, as we mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, enzyme induces dilantin, carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, phenobarbital, they can... Uh, in, uh, they can decrease the efficacy of uh, statins by increasing their metabolism, which means that they will, you will have a hyperlipidemia or hypercholesterolemia because mm-hmm. the statins are not, not working as effectively, which means there will be increased risk of stroke, which has been proven by a study. Mm-hmm. So these are some specific examples that you have to keep in mind. And then, you know, uh, many of these enzyme inducers, they also increase metabolism of cardi- uh, cardiac antiarrhythmic agents, uh, antidepressants, right. anticoagulants, neuroleptics. So again, you know, stay away from and, them if you can. Yeah, and some of those sodium channel drugs are in themselves antiarrhythmics like phenytoin. Oh, yeah. Uh, which, you know, just an extra wrinkle to throw into the mix there. Absolutely. Uh, so... So some basic principles, avoid these older medications. And then when you mm-hmm. start a medication, start low dose, go yeah. up slowly. And usually they will get efficacy even at a low dose. So for example, mm-hmm. and, you know, when I started doing this, I was surprised that more in lev- for Lamictal, most of the patients, they respond to a dose of uh, 100 milligrams daily or 50 milligrams twice a day. Interesting. Uh, for Depakote, they respond sometimes at 500 milligrams or 750 milligrams daily, which is a much lower than what you would expect for a yeah. younger adult. The data for which medication to use in older adults is, I would say, somewhat limited. So there mm-hmm. are a handful of trials between around f- between 15 and 20 trials that were specific to older adults, uh, and these are clinical trials that were randomized. Mm -hmm. Uh, And most of these clinical trials, they compared newer medications, and these were either Vimpat, Keppra, or Lamictal, to one of Mm -hmm. the older medications. And the most common older medication was carbamazepine or Tegretol. Uh, So, uh, but you know, if you combine all of this together, so there were two... uh, Systematic reviews and meta-analysis that were published in epilepsy in 2019, which is kind of what I use for my mm-hmm. guidance of uh, uh, medication management. So the first one, which was uh, systematic review and meta-analysis of all the clinical trials of elderly, uh, they found that for seizure freedom, which was the one of the main um, uh, endpoints, uh, Keppra was better than Lamictal, which was equal to Tegretol. So Kepra mm-hmm. was in essentially better than Lamictal and Teg- Tegretol, which were the other two most commonly tested yeah. medications. As far as adverse effects, Lamictal was the best. So right. if you, based on this data, on, on these limited number of medications, mm-hmm. you would say Kepra is probably the best, followed by Lamictal, followed, followed by carbamazepine. Mm-hmm. But Kepra and Lamictal might be pretty close. Yeah. Then the second uh, uh, systematic review, which was for just monotherapy, the previous systematic mm-hmm. review for, for was for all monotherapy and add-on therapy. For the monotherapy, which had five clinical trials, uh, the overall the efficacy was the same for Vimpat. Uh, sorry, let me cancel that. Overall, the efficacy was mm-hmm. better for Vimpat uh, than Lamictal mm-hmm. and then Kepra. Mm. And and carbamazepine was the worst for the side effects. Okay. So interesting. It this was this was based on a network meta analysis. So it's not a mm-hmm. real, you know it's like comparing if you have a right, clinical right. trial that has A versus B <clears throat> and then another versus B versus C, then how do you compare A versus C? And that's by doing this network meta analysis. So it's based on those kind of analysis. But anyways, I think we can concur probably based on the results of these various uh, clinical trials and also these two systematic reviews is that Vimpat, Lamictal, and Kepra are probably your best bet at mm-hmm. this point. Yeah. Bear in mind that we do not have data for, right. or comparative data, I should say, for all the uh, newest medications. Um, right, right. So, so at this point, I think at least my clinical practice is, you know, Kepra, Vimpat, Lamictal, which makes it easy. Uh, but, you know, and now uh, Vimpat is generic, which makes it really right. easy to prescribe. Previously, I used to have some issues with insurance and copay, uh, but now it's uh, it's easy. So I would probably say Vimpat is probably my number one choice mm-hmm. at this point. 
uh, followed by Capra, and then Levitical. Really? I always find that interesting. I, I maybe maybe I'm just using too high of doses. I tend to find uh, that Vimpat is a little more sedating um, in some people as opposed to like you know uh, Lamotrigine or uh, Levetiracetam. But um, just you know anecdotally, if you will. Right. Right. Sometimes it's also, I think, a matter of the um, how you are um, increasing the medication, the rapidity mm-hmm. of increasing the medication. I, I mean, unless you know patients are having mm-hmm. frequent seizures, I tend to do very slowly, especially in older patients. You know, I increase mm-hmm. like in like one month. I, you know, so yeah. like, uh, okay, it's so, like almost twice twice as long or longer than uh, compared yeah. to the usual schedules. Yeah. Yeah, and and as we discussed, you know, you don't need a need to get to a very high dose in these patients in older adults. So you can right. afford to start slowly and increase slowly, and I think that probably yeah. will give you the best tolerability. And if patients are tolerating it, they are less likely to stop it without informing you, which is another right. issue that people run into. Uh, right, stopping and not, not informing the physicians. Do you have any issues with leucosamine? I know that you know some some patients. They go to the pharmacy and they find out that uh, the Vimpat's a scheduled medication, and they're like, "Oh, I don't want to take this. You know, it's dangerous." Um, is that anything that you know? Again, just because you're dealing with maybe a little bit of an older generation, uh, maybe a little bit different uh, uh, perception on that aspect, is that tied into your medication compliance in your population? Uh, not really. I don't think I've had that oh, particular problem with Vimpat. Yeah, I've had the issue where it's not covered by insurance or it's expensive or something like that. Right, right. But. Fascinating. Yeah, well, that's cool. And the Cosmite doesn't have as much protein binding. That does make sense that it would work well in that population. I just always kind of, uh, I, I guess I was too gun shy, you know, pulling away from it just because of its, uh, you know, sodium channels. And I always try and stay away from some of the, sure. some of the, sure. yeah, yeah. I, but, I think if you go to a high dose, I'm sure, you know, you'll have lots of dizziness and loss of balance mm-hmm. and diplopia, right. but I think at a low dose, it's tolerated pretty well. Awesome. Well, that's cool. Uh, yeah. I'll have to keep that in mind going forward, uh, on those particular patients. Now, <clears throat> Another aspect, you know, because I know, uh, you know, when we're looking at the etiology for developing epilepsy in, in an older population, we're mm-hmm. seeing probably more neurodegenerative dementia uh, type diagnoses coming yeah. kind of hand in glove with that. Um, in patients with with behavioral issues like, you know, delusions, uh, hallucinations, etc., do you find that sometimes you are going back to those older medications like valproate or do you sometimes are you able to, is lamotrigine as effective in your experience for some of those behavioral issues? Uh, Not so much Lamotrigine, but I've had, anecdotally, I've had uh, Mm -hmm. good experiences with Depakote and Mm -hmm. Gabapentin uh, for uh, if someone has having behavioral issues and also have seizures. uh, Mm -hmm. Then, you know, I've tried this not as first line. I've tried to, you know, try to Mm -hmm. control their seizures with the usual anti-seizure medications, which I think is best overall. But yeah. if they continue to have behavioral side effects, then I have, you know, in a handful of patients, I've used Depakote or Gabapentin. And I would say mm-hmm. the results have been, you know, fairly good. Uh, but if you look at the actual data, then mm-hmm. um, you will find that uh, the, the data uh, suggests that they are, you know, they're not effective. But that personally, that right. has not been my experience. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like, you know, you look at the general adult data for something like gabapentin. It's it's atrocious for seizure control. But there are, like you said, there are some studies that, that show that in, in elderly patients, it might even be a potentially first line medication for, for epilepsy. Yeah. I will actually, if you look at the uh, guidelines, gabapentin and lamictal are supposed to be the best mm-hmm. for epilepsy in older adults, which I, you know, kind of disagree with. I don't think gabapentin is the best. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but in, in, in a particular subset where you're trying to deal with behavioral issues, mm-hmm. I think gabapentin might be a good, uh, you know, good tool to have mm-hmm. in your arsenal. Gotcha. Do you ever find like, you know, your standard release versus like the gabapentin, uh, I can never say it right, and a carbol, uh, like the long acting gabapentin, eh, is it? I've not potato? used it to be honest. I've, okay. I've not really Fair used enough. it, so I, I can't say. Because <laughs> I think that part. one's still pretty expensive, so that might. 
yeah, that might be a yeah, reason yeah. not to. Yeah. But um, yeah. is it is it mostly like you're kind of using it at night for like sundowning or like nighttime agitation or just kind of the standard like three times a day yeah, dosing? Yeah. So uh, yeah, depending on the uh, requirement for the patient as as mm-hmm. for sundowning, sometimes PRN, sometimes standing. Um, okay. In a patient uh, that I have with uh, Lewy body dementia and epilepsy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I use it as like stand uh, standing twice a day because he would mm-hmm. have a lot of anxiety and also hallucinations, uh, okay. you know, throughout. And that has helped, even though it's not technically an antipsychotic. At least it has helped him deal mm-hmm. better with the anxiety related to the hallucinations. Nice. Yeah, that's a nice little trick. I'll have yeah. to keep that one in mind. Yeah, but be but, mindful yeah. of myoclonus. Oh yeah, <laughs> with yeah, gabapentin. No, I... <laughs> Right, so I, I'm covering mostly inpatient uh, neurology consults uh, the last year or so, and uh, most seizures, I'm using air quotes here for our listeners, uh, or uh, confusion, things like that. It's someone who's like gone into like an acute kidney injury type situation, yeah. and the, no one changed their pregabalin or gabapentin exactly. doses, and it's like the patient was fine mental uh mental alertness wise when they came in and then over three days they just kept getting worse and worse and gosh what's going on yeah god yeah i don't know uh (laughs) but uh, but yes no the the myoclonus thing is is a very uh it's very overlooked by a lot of people outside of neurology yes um but 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 yeah it it can be you know like you said earlier falls very very problematic uh in those situations and the mental status continues to deteriorate as long as that and you're like is there dementia getting worse or am i doing this with my medication and so on yeah absolutely i think i think i'm so biased uh towards myoclonus caused by gabapentin and pregabalin now that every time i'm on inpatient Mm -hmm. service and i hear myoclonus (laughs) i look at their medication list first and i was like (laughs) their medication list and their renal function yeah yeah, there's a lot of things that cause myoclonus that uh, that I think people forget about. And, yeah. you know, it was a different conversation, but a lot of people don't know what myoclonus, or asterixis for that matter, uh, looks yeah. like. And, um, yeah, that's, uh, if you don't know what you're looking at, you're not going to necessarily diagnose it correctly, <laughs> right? That's true. That's true. But it's, it's always a, it's a great uh, uh, thing to, uh, you know, to come up with in front of residents, they're always impressed because then yeah. they stop the pregabalin and the gabapentin, the myoclonus goes away. So it's, yeah. a, you know, for all those new attendings out there, this is a nice tool to impress <laughs> your residents. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, any any final thoughts in terms of uh, seizure medication selection, uh, big do's, don'ts that you haven't already hit on? Hmm. Let me think. I think you covered uh, everything, right? What, what do you think? Did I miss something? Let's say let's say you've you've reached for you know uh, like you know lecosamide. You've at what dose would you push? Let's say someone with let's say mild cognitive impairment or versus early Alzheimer's dementia. How hard would you push that in in an elderly patient in terms of like maybe dose increases um, before you'd say this isn't working and I think I'm pushing the risk for for increasing falls and so forth yeah i think um f- well first of all i think for alzheimer's disease if you suspect someone has alzheimer's mm-hmm. disease capra is probably the best medication mm-hmm. as long as they are not having baseline agitation because mm-hmm. uh, we have some animal and now some human evidence also that mm-hmm. capra can help with cognition uh, especially executive functioning and uh, visual spatial memory. So mm-hmm. uh, I think that has been uh, proven in a randomized trial. So that in Alzheimer's disease, at least that's my first go-to medication. Okay. As far as pushing the dose, uh, yeah, it's always tricky. I think uh, I would, you know, I would if if in an ad- a younger adult, I would give up at two thousand milligrams twice a day of Capra. In mm-hmm. a older adult, I would probably give up at you know fifteen hundred twice a day, or even even before that. Mm -hmm. Uh, but again, I tend to increase it slowly. So for example, if someone, Mm -hmm. if you're seeing a younger adult at a thousand milligrams twice a day of Capra, and you want to increase the dose, you would usually go to 1500 twice a day, right? If they're still having seizures in an older adult, I would go to a thousand and 1500 rather than 1500 twice a day. So again, 
increase the gotcha. dose slowly rather than don't just uh, copy paste what you do with younger adults <laughs> <laughs> right i do think that that is something we see a lot is and you know, obviously this this varies significantly by situation you know how much benefit did you get from your first medication and i know people talk about uh, substitution versus add-on therapy when we talk about, you know, our second seizure medication. Mm-hmm. Um, do you find that even if, let's say, someone had, you know, modest benefits from the first seizure medication, are you more likely uh, to lean towards substitution versus add-on just because of the polypharmacy aspect in, in a more elderly population? Or is it really just individually dependent? I think it's individually dependent. Uh, mm-hmm. depending on their comfort level, how much support I think they have at home. Yeah. Uh, you know, in like in a nursing home setting, I might be, uh, I might do substitution because you can, you know, hopefully uh, depend on the nursing home uh, nurses. You're a little to... more optimistic than I am. But... <laughs> <laughs> that uh, the appropriate medication changes will be made. Uh, yeah. in if, if, if there is someone that I, I, I feel like, you know, Mm-hmm. It might be too confusing, weaning off one right, and right. increasing the other. Then I might, you know, do dual therapy and then, if possible, wean them off uh, one of the medications. Makes sense. Well, I, thank you so much for giving us these tips and tricks. As, as uh, you know, a lot of us in neurology know, we kind of, we do see this big upswing as we get towards uh, later life with epilepsy. And, you know, it's not copy paste, like you said, you know, we need to keep the pharmacodynamics and the uh, physiology of the patient in mind. And those are always good things to keep in mind, especially if we're used to more like early adults or middle aged adults uh, in our practice to make sure we're not over medicating our patients to a large extent. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, last question that just just came to mind. Uh, how often do you get folks who are coming in? who are maybe already treated for epilepsy and you're like, this patient is way over medicated and you're just pulling, you know, like you're a magician pulling scarves out of that. You're just taking the medications off one after the other, uh, over a period of weeks or months, uh, because you think like this patient's barely awake. They're just sitting here. And I think it's because of the medication regimen. Uh, I mean, fortunately hasn't happened a lot in my practice in older patients. Mm-hmm. Uh, but once in a while, yes, you will see someone who is on, you know, sub-maximal doses of four different anti medications. Yeah. Uh, you know, this usually happens, uh, in my experience at least, uh, when patients are in a nursing home. And mm-hmm. I don't know why, why it happens in that scenario. Uh, rather than mm-hmm. patients who are independent, I don't see it as often. But yeah, you will see three different medications at sub-maximal doses. So I try to, I try mm-hmm. to kind of simplify that. Um, but it's always tricky. I think if anyone who has seen patients from nursing home, you always know that it's very difficult to know if they are having still having seizures or not, or what's right. going on. Unless unless yeah. they are very dramatic, generalized tonic clonic seizures, sometimes it's very difficult to know. Yeah, that is that is an excellent point. Yeah, it's not uh, that old maxim, right? Not everything that shakes is a seizure. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's definitely challenging when you don't have that accurate uh, story to guide yeah. your management. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to to talk with me, talk with us, and kind of give us some of these uh, tips and tricks that uh, that you've been using in this patient population. Now, you also have some projects of your own. I know we uh, we met on Twitter via some mutual connections and. Uh, I usually am quite enjoying what you're posting on there, but uh, do you have any projects you want to plug for people who might be listening in, uh, where they can find you and so forth? Well, you can definitely find me on Twitter. I'm trying to be active, trying to um, you know talk about things that we are usually not taught in uh, in academia. Uh, so you know, if you are interested, follow me there. Uh, my uh, Twitter handle is at Rohit Marawa. So that's my first name and last name. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, I think I'm trying to uh, do something which I wish I had when I was a resident or a early career faculty. Um, so I'm hoping that p- other people are finding useful what I've been posting. Awesome. Yeah, I know. I've uh, I've been finding it uh, say, uh, somewhat inspirational. And uh, <laughs> like you said, it's one of those things where 
I think the best thing I got from some of my trainers was like, you need to know about medicine now so that you can learn about medicine when you graduate. I'm like, well, that, in <laughs> hindsight, that might be a little too late, but uh, at least they were leaning in the right direction. But no, it's, yes. it's good. We're seeing a lot more, especially with social media and uh, people like yourself yeah. uh, kind of uh, trying to make sure that people are able to kind of strive for that work-life balance and, uh, you know, hopefully... Yeah be more satisfied, have more longevity in their careers and and all that good stuff. Exactly. I'm trying to promote the hashtag academic physician life. It hasn't caught on fire yet, but uh, it hasn't gone viral yet, but I'm hoping it (laughs) will. Awesome. Awesome. I love it. Uh, Well, thank you again. I appreciate it. And we'll have to, we'll have to chat again at some point. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Thank you, Michael. This was wonderful. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate, review, and share it on Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, and please subscribe for future episodes. You can reach me on Twitter at Dr. Kentris, that's D-R-K-E-N-T-R-I-S, or by email at the Neurotransmitters Podcast at gmail.com with any questions or show suggestions.